Have you ever had one of those moments where your immaturity was on full display for everybody else to see? You know what I'm talking about? Where you kind of think, I have arrived, I am a mature young person, or I'm a mature person, and uh, then you make a fool of yourself. It's very clear that you have not yet arrived. I remember when I was uh, 15 years old, I was looking towards getting my permit, and I thought, I've got this thing on lock. Like, I don't need any training. My dad kept talking about, we need to go to a parking lot uh, that's vacant so you don't kill anybody, and drive around and teach you some maneuvers in the car before you go get your license and permit. And I told him, Dad, I've got this down pat, man. I've been driving golf carts for years with my uncle at the golf course. I've got this down. No worries, right? I thought I had arrived. I'm I'm a mature young man. Well, finally, my dad takes me to Vine Street Baptist. They have a big old uh, empty church parking lot that night. And so he gets out of the driver's seat. And I can remember the sheer terror in his face as he hands his child, me, the keys and sits down in the passenger seat. For the first time ever, his life is literally in my hands. And we get going, and I quickly realize this thing responds very differently than a golf cart, right? So some terror starts coming into my heart. I'm I'm starting to freak out a little bit. But remember, I'm a mature young man, so I'm not going to let him know that. I've already made my case for how much I don't need this training, And he brings me through all kinds of maneuvers in the parking lot, and I did them swimmingly. And then at the end of the session, he said, all right, Mr. Mr. I've arrived. Why don't you drive us home? What? I kept it cool on the outside, but internally I was melting. Like, you mean on the the street, the one with the lines and the stop signs and the lights? We're going to die. And so I didn't let him know how scared I was because I I wanted to be this mature young man. So I get on the road and I'm driving and we finally get to our first stoplight. And every signal in my brain was firing at the same time. Like all my synapses are just going nutso. And I have no cohesive thought whatsoever. I see that the traffic signal is turning from green to yellow and soon to be red. And what do I do? I don't know why, but I punch it pedal to the metal, touching the floorboard, and I am zooming through this intersection as there's a red light. About uh, 10 feet in, I realize it's a red light. I slam on my brakes, and my immaturity was on full display, not just for my father, but all the innocent bystanders that are watching from the sidewalk, looking at this lunatic in a vehicle. I had thought I had made it, but it was clear before, ev- before everybody that I w- had not yet arrived. Today, we're going to continue our series in Philippians, where we've been looking at Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And we're going to look at the idea of spiritual maturity in Philippians 3, 12 to 21. And I think it's very easy for us to kind of have the mentality that I had that day, Right? I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray to Jesus, I've got some memory verses, I know where the books are in the Bible, and we can easily say, man, I've attained this. Paul the Apostle is actually going to attack that idea in this passage today. And so I just want to start with a question. How would you define spiritual maturity? Would you, would you define it by some of those things I just described? Church attendance, life group attendance, Bible knowledge, how many Bible studies you've done. If you've led a Bible study, then maybe you're even more holy. It might shock us to know that Scripture doesn't define spiritual maturity that way. It's not about the activities of our life. It's not about our information. It's not, not about what we know. It's the transformation of God in our hearts. Spiritual maturity is not based on intellectual capacity. It's not based on what we know. And so we're going to jump outside of Philippians for a moment to find a, a biblical definition of spiritual maturity. It's interesting, even though this whole section we're about to go through, Paul is, is saying, I'm on a trajectory of growth and maturity. Mature people should think this way. Everybody become mature. He doesn't really define maturity for us. So we're going to go to Galatians 5. This is a fairly familiar passage. But Galatians 5, says, But the fruit of the Spirit, notice, spiritual maturity cannot be Uh, you you can't grow in spiritual maturity apart from the spirit. It's kind of in the name, spiritual maturity, the spirit, okay? But the fruit of the spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He's saying, look, it's not just about what you know. Those things, Bible reading and memorization and attending church and being in community, those are good things, but those are means to an end. Those should lead to this, the transformation of our hearts. This is what Jesus' life looked like. And this is what our lives should look like increasingly throughout them as we are yielded to God. And so Paul, the first thing he's going to challenge us to is that spiritual maturity is a direction, not a destination. It's not a place we can arrive at. Much like me in the driver's seat thinking I had made it, it's not a place that we can arrive at. And to, to give us a little bit of context, last week, Pastor Craig walked us through the idea of righteousness, that we are not made right by our works or by works of the law, but simply by faith in Christ. That, so that's what makes us right. And at the end of that passage that he was teaching, Jesus, he's saying, I want more of Jesus. I, I want to know Christ in his sufferings. I want to know him in his resurrection. I want more of him in my life and, and less of me. And he's going to continue that thought as he has a dialogue with the church about spiritual maturity. Let's look at it. Verse 12, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, So he's saying, look, I want more of Christ. I want to be more like him. I want to grow to to understand and know him better. But I'm not there yet. I have not already obtained this. I am not already perfect. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I want to pause here. Paul the apostle says, I have not already obtained this and I'm not already perfect. Let's just be real. If Paul hasn't attained spiritual maturity. If, it's, if he hasn't arrived, none of us have. This is the guy who was shipwrecked, who was beaten, who was, uh, they attempted to execute him by stoning him to death, that, that he's been imprisoned for his faith. All of this for his faith. And, and in the midst of his imprisonment in, in Philippians, we just saw, he says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. This is a gospel-centric man. This is somebody who God transformed. And he's saying, look, I'm a work in progress. I haven't attained this. Spiritual maturity is a direction, not a destination. It's not somewhere you can just arrive at and then coast for the rest of your life. This is a transformative process that God brings people through for the entirety of their life. From the moment we trust him, that's the beginning of a lifelong journey of transformation as we're yielded to God. And at Family Church, we kind of talk about it this way. This is our spiritual pathway. And this, this is a, a helpful tool to help us understand what we mean, that spiritual, spiritual maturity excuse me, is a direction, not a destination. It begins with somebody we would call a seeker. Now, a seeker is somebody who is far from God, does not know Christ, does not trust Christ, um, but they may be asking spiritual questions. They, God may be drawing them to himself. Right? And at some point, that person has a decision to make. And as they respond to the gospel, that's that first bridge here. We call these little arrows kind of paradigm shifts where they, they hear the gospel. Right? We talked about this last week. Second Corinthians talks about he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange because of Jesus' life, perfect life that we could never live because of his perfect sacrificial death that we deserve and his resurrection. Now, when they hear the gospel, they can repent and place their faith in him and in him alone. And they become what we call a student. Now, a student isn't just somebody who's learning a bunch of stuff. Uh, That's true. But remember, spiritual maturity is not based on just intellectual capacity. It's not based on years of knowledge, right? We can have lots of information and it never make the distance to our hearts and transform us. And so a student is somebody who's kind of a baby Christian. They're they're very me-centered. They're very focused on what they want, their desires, but they have spiritual life. They are a child of God and they're learning what it means to follow God. And this next bridge here, our paradigm shift, it has the Bible there. And this isn't just, again, gaining information. The information, the knowledge from scripture should lead to transformation. And often what we see in students is this bridge is a greater understanding of their identity. Firstly, who God is. And then as a result of who he is and what he's done, who I am. 
And as a student begins to understand, not just intellectually, but actually experience the ramifications of you are a child of God. You are loved. You are accepted. As they begin to understand that and work through that, they move to what we would call a servant. A servant is not self-focused. They're others focused. This is a person who's excited about the community of God, excited about the family. They're often the people that you see serving in a lot of different capacities. But it isn't just about what they do. This pathway is not a journey of activity. It's a journey of our hearts. This is a transformative process that God brings us through. And ultimately, over time, as a servant is brought through some trials, we have the last paradigm shift there or bridge the heart. Because there's a moment where there's a deeper level of surrender, where it's not other-centered anymore. They transition to a steward where we call them God-centered. And this, often this transition comes through a season of difficulty, trial, tribulation, hardship, loss, grief, where they say, God, not my kingdom, but yours. And you may look at this and say, but wait, Jason, you just told me that uh, spiritual maturity is a direction, not a destination. Sure looks like there's an ending to this. And I get that, but we may be a steward in one area of our life and a student in another. You may be a steward in how you uh, handle your finances and, and a student in how you handle your relationships. And so this is a process in all areas of our lives that God is transforming us. Spiritual maturity is a direction, not a destination. And Paul the apostle says, man, I have not arrived. And if he hasn't arrived, the man who brought the gospel to Asia, man, it's okay that we're works in progress as well. And I like what he says here at the second half of the verse, but I press on to make it my own. He presses on, he's pushing forward for this growth in Christ. Why? He tells us why. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He's, this is an identity statement. He's saying, why do I pursue growth? Why do I pursue maturity? Why do I pursue uh, the resurrection of my dead parts of my life? Because Jesus has made me his own. And he's encouraging the Philippians. Jesus has made you his own. And I would encourage you, if you have repented and placed your faith in Jesus, Jesus has made you his own. Now here's the question. How yielded to Jesus are you? How surrendered to Jesus are you? How submitted to God are you? I was challenged by this. Uh, over the last summer, I was uh, in a men's discipleship group where we read this book called Chair Time by Dan Sutherland. It's a great book on prayer. And the basic essence of the book is he challenges the reader to read 15 minutes, or I'm sorry, not read, pray 15 minutes every day in silence. Silence. And as a group, we, we, we all were hearing this challenge and the, the idea was to, to come together in our, in our separate uh, private prayer times and, and hold each other accountable to pray for 15 minutes in silence. And so we all agreed to it. And the first week I did it and like, I, I got nothing out of it. All I heard was my own mouth breathing. Like I'm a mouth breather apparently because I just sat there in silence and I just heard my heart breathe and my breath. And so uh, the next week though, I came to the group and I'm like, look guys, I'm actually, I don't, I don't really want to do this. I'm kind of scared to do this. And one of the guys in the group lovingly asked me why. And I said, well, if, if God tells me to do something, then I'm responsible to do it. And if I'm going to sit here in silence before the Lord, waiting for him to speak to me, then the onus is on me to actually follow up on what he says. And I'm scared that God might call me to do something that I really don't want to do. Like, what if I have to go from zero to hut in Africa in, in the next year? Like, that's not going to be an exciting thing for me. What if God calls me to do something I don't want to do? And so they encouraged me to keep going, keep, keep having this silent time before God. And so I went back into my prayer time and the next week, about partway through, I'm sitting there, eight o'clock, my kids are in bed, my wife's reading a book, I'm doing my silent time, and I remember, I believe, God saying, I love you, do you believe that? I love you, do you believe that? I was so worried that God was going to call me to do something awful, and instead, he reminded me of his love. It is God's love that transforms us. It's his kindness that draws us to repentance. 
And if we want to be people of spiritual maturity, we have to be people who are okay coming before the God of the universe, sitting before his throne and listening to what he has to say to us. As he prompts us, as he nudges us, as he speaks to us, his children. Spiritual maturity is a direction, not a destination. And it requires us to sit before the throne of God and say, God, what do you want to do in me? And how can I join you in that? And Paul goes on in the passage, brothers. And I want to add, this is the word adelphos in the Greek. And it's brothers and sisters. Ladies, you don't get out of this. Uh, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Again, I'm not perfect. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward toward what lies ahead. He says, look, I haven't made it yet. But there's a shift in my focus that has taken place. Forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead. Here's what I think he's saying. Spiritual maturity requires focus on Jesus, not yourself. Spiritual maturity requires focus on Jesus, not yourself. He says, I forget what's behind me. Think about Paul's story. Like he's got some baggage in his history. He oversaw one of the first Christian martyrs' deaths, Stephen. He had authority from the the religious elite to go and find Christians to imprison them. Like he zealously persecuted Christ and his church. He's got baggage in his history. And he says, I forget that to push on towards the goal, to push on and strain forward. Now, what he's not saying is that if there's unresolved sin in your history, you just forget it and move forward, right? Scripture has lots to say about reconciliation, about living at peace with everybody as far as it depends on you, about forgiveness. Here's what I think he's saying. When he says, I forget what's behind, he's saying, I'm shifting my focus. That's behind me and I'm focusing in on Jesus. He's saying, forget everything that hinders faith, and obedience. Forget everything behind you that hinders faith and obedience. He says, I forget that and I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he tells us, this kind of a wordy statement, but let's break it down. I press on toward the goal for the prize. What's the prize? The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's saying, one day I'm going to be with Jesus, this upward call of resurrection to be with him face to face. And this transforming process that God is bringing me through is ultimately going to be fulfilled on that day. And so I forget what lies behind and I strain forward. What in your life is inhibiting your spiritual maturity? What in your past is inhibiting your spiritual growth? I can think of really two kind of categories that these things fall into. Firstly, our failures. Much like Paul, many of us have baggage in our histories, right? Maybe it's before Christ, or maybe it's even sin you wrestled with after Christ. And you can look at those things and say, man, God could never use me. I'm too messed up. If God can take Paul, a murderer, and give him a mission, God can certainly use you. I want you to hear that. Like Paul's life transformation is the definitive statement that you and I are not too messed up to advance the gospel kingdom. We're not too messed up for God to use and transform us. But we can look back at our failures and in, in doing so, not be aware of what God is doing today because who you used to be is not who you're becoming. God is transforming you by the power of his spirit. Are you focused on your failures? The second thing I think can stop us is our successes. We can look back at our history with God and be like, wow, Jesus really used me. Like, I'm going to just coast for the rest of my life. Like, God did some great stuff back in 1982. God did some great stuff five years ago. I'm going to coast for the rest of my life. Listen, I say this carefully. God does not want you to retire from the mission. Like there is no retirement from the mission. And spiritual maturity is about the mission. It's to be more effective in our mission. 
So what, what of those two categories is hindering your spiritual growth? What, what is stopping your spiritual maturity? Are you focused on your past and yourself or are you focused on Jesus and what he's doing in you today as he transforms you to, to exhibit the fruit of the spirit that we talked about at the beginning? Love, joy, peace, all of that fruit, God will transform your life as you yield to him and focus on him. And Paul says, this is how mature people think. Like this is the one time in the passage that he actually uses this word, although he's talking about it all over the place. He says, this is how mature people think. We forget what hinders our faith and obedience and we strain forward, focused on Christ in the direction of spiritual growth. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And he continues, if, any, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So if we're, if we're forgetting the stuff in our history and we're focusing in on Jesus, here's the question I have for you. What stirs your affections for Jesus? What stirs your affections for Jesus? Is there a specific passage of scripture where when you read it, you're just like, oh my word, Jesus, you're powerful, you're awesome, you're forgiving. Whatever it is that your heart needs to hear. Is there a specific way to pray that just, it makes you enamored with Christ? Are there things maybe outside that that help you focus in on Jesus? I know for me, when I summit a mountain and sit on top of that thing and look out at the vastness of creation, I cry every time. Why? Because I, I realize a big old God loves little old me. And it stirs up my affections. My mom, on the other hand, last time I took her hiking, she wore high heels, okay? She, that doesn't stir her affections. So for each of us, there's probably something different for you. What is it for you? It could be nature, getting out in creation. It could be, uh, it could be music. It could be art. It could be serving others. It could be relationships that you have where there's somebody that just really just reminds you of the goodness of Jesus. What stirs your affections for Jesus? Take your eyes off those things in the past. Find out what that thing is and pursue Christ through that relentlessly. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Spiritual maturity requires focus in on Jesus. Is he your focus right now today? The next thing that Paul is going to challenge us to in the passage is spiritual maturity requires godly community. Let's look at it here in the passage. Brothers, again, brothers and sisters, Adelphos, join in imitating me. <laughs> he's speaking to a church and he's like, imitate me. Anybody else want to get up here and just like, hey, brothers and sisters, uh, do what I do. Whatever I say, you go for it. Whatever I do, you do it too. Like, no, like, I don't know about you, but like I, I respond wrong sometimes. I, I make dumb choices sometimes. Like I, this statement is astounding to me, but Paul is not saying I've arrived. So follow me. He's saying, imitate me in my faith, in my focus on Jesus. Imitate me in my surrender to God. He's saying, I know I haven't arrived, but I'm focused on him. Imitate me in my trajectory of my life. And he says, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He says, look at Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus. These are, these are faithful servants of the gospel, partners in the gospel with the Philippian church. And he says, watch them. Like watch the conduct of their lives. This word walk it's not just what they know, it's how they live. This is the fruit of the Spirit that's being exhibited in their lives. And he says something fairly sobering next. He says, watch us, and here's why. Because, or for, many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. He's, he's speaking to a church and he's saying, look, you need to be aware of who you're allowing to influence you. There are those that are walking not with Christ. They're not focused on Christ. They're not the trajectory of their life. The direction of their life is not to grow spiritually in spiritual maturity. It's they walk as enemies of Christ. Who we allow to influence us is a big deal. 
And he goes on to expound what their life looks like. Their end is destruction. One day they'll be eternally separated from God. More than that, their God is their belly. Now I know we just had Thanksgiving, but he's not rebuking 2022 Christians for eat going hog wild on some cranberry sauce, all right? I just had a ton of cranberry sauce. But, but, and they glory in their shame. He's saying, look, their God is their fleshly desires. They glory in their fleshly desires. And look at this, with minds set on earthly things. Their focus isn't Jesus. It's whatever they want in the moment right now. Who we surround ourselves with, those people that we follow their example matter. Spiritual maturity requires living in godly community. It doesn't mean we're not in relationship with ungodly people, unbelievers. That's the mission. But he's talking about here who influences you. We need to surround ourselves with good examples because we need to know what it looks like to be a, a man and a woman who are followers of Christ. Like I need to see what it looks like to be a father who lives out the gospel in his parenting. You need to see what it looks like to to be a mother who lives out the gospel in her parenting. We need to see what it looks like to be spouses that live out the gospel in marriages. We need to see what it looks like to be sons and daughters who live out the gospel. We need godly examples around us to say, oh, that's what this looks like. And I want to say this carefully. Sunday service is very important. God has called us to this, to come together and worship. We're actually commanded to sing songs to God. Uh, And and it's a great place to have an on-ramp for community. We're commanded to come together and not forsake the assembly. It's a good place, but it's an on-ramp for community. It is not the end-all be-all. And so I want to challenge you. If Sunday, one hour every Sunday is your community, you are missing out on what Paul is talking about and you will be lopsided in your spiritual growth. We need each other beyond these four walls and this one hour a week. I need you, you need me. And this is why we heavily invest in life groups and in discipleship at Family Church. And so I would ask you, if you don't know where to start, look for somebody that you see in their life, something that you don't have that they're godly, that they're transparent, that they love Jesus, whatever it is, and ask them to coffee. Build, begin building relationship. You and I are made for relationship. And this is a great on-ramp place, but it is not the end-all be-all. We need to go deeper than this. Paul closes out this passage. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. This is an awesome statement. Our primary citizenship is not the United States. It's heaven. We're citizens of God's kingdom. And from it, we, eat, we await a savior. The word there in the original language is eager anticipation. Can't wait for this to happen. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Anybody got a lowly body? Like I got bad knees, acid reflux, and now I'm getting gray in my beard. All right, I got a lowly body. But one day, Jesus is going to transform this. And I think why Paul ends this chapter this way is because This is the ultimate culmination of all the work that God has done in our lives throughout them. All the transformation of our mind, our will, our emotions, our spirit ultimately is culminated on this day when our lowly bodies will be transformed and all the work God has done throughout our lives will come to its total and complete fruition as we receive a glorious body. More importantly, as we get the final and total receiving of Christ on that day. And he goes on to say, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That day is going to exhibit Jesus's power. The same power that raised him from the dead. The same power that transforms you and I. We can't transform ourselves. He does it. And so we press on with all of his might. We strain towards the goal with all of his might. I'm going to release to the campuses. Jesus loves you. So do I. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. It's been a privilege to walk through Philippians with you. And uh, today we want to just dive into a couple of challenges out of the passage that we just read, where Paul's challenging us to grow in our maturity. The first one I want to challenge you to is what is your, what in your past is inhibiting your current spiritual maturity? Are there things that you're focused back here that that are uh, your successes or your failures 
that you have disqualified yourself from current growth trajectory. And the second thing we want to challenge you to is who in your community is a godly example for you. Paul says to the Philippians, imitate me and find people who live like I do and imitate them. Who in your sphere of influence, in where you live, work, play, who is it that is a godly example for you to follow? And if you don't have one, I begin praying that God would bring that person into your life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word that is a compass of truth in a sea of falsehood uh, that is the world. And I pray, God, that as we're challenged to grow, it, it is a hard challenge to take a look in the mirror and say, uh, there's some things that Jesus wants to change, to hear from the Spirit and say, okay, God, I will, sur I will surrender. And so I pray for those of us who know, God, maybe what you have called us to surrender, um, but have ignored that call. I pray that you would give us the courage and faith to trust you and finally surrender. And God, I pray um, that for those that don't have a godly example in their community, or maybe even don't have a community, that you would begin to bring good, godly people into their lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great week.